host, Heather Ashley, and welcome to another episode of Women of Her Story, a podcast dedicated to celebrating women who have made or are making their mark on our society. Today, I have with me author and fellow bearer of the best name, Heather Reed. Thank you so much for joining us today, Heather. Thanks, Heather. I'm really excited to be here. How are you doing today? I'm good. Not bad. It's a little rainy, but, uh, you know, it's a good day for reading and curling up with a book. That's what I think. Perfect. What kind of books do you like reading? Oh, I'm very eclectic with my reading habits, um, but I tend to go more for fantasy, sci-fi, um, but I do love a good biography, um, nonfiction, <laughs> crime stories, um, pretty much anything. Yeah. What not are you into right now? Not too much on the romance, but um, yeah. Oh, right now I'm reading, I'm actually rereading a series uh, by Robin Hobb, um, which I love the Farseer trilogy. It's sort of something I haven't read in about 20 years mm -hmm. and I love her work. And I just felt like with everything going on in the world, I just wanted to dive back into a story and characters that just comforted me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm doing right now. Mm, I love that. What, uh, what type of books do you enjoy writing? I write anything under the speculative fiction umbrella. So hmm. my first books were young adult. I kind of consider them paranormal, paranormal romance to an extent. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I also write fantasy. I have um, a sci-fi book kind of in the works. Anything sort of considered speculative. I don't write um, contemporary mm -hmm. at all, although mm -hmm. I think contemporary work's amazing. It's just not my strong point. It's mm -hmm. not something that I'm drawn to. Mm -hmm. so. Have you ever considered writing um, like biographies or anything like that? No, I really don't think I'm good at nonfiction. <laughs> I'm very much a fiction writer. Everything that goes on in my brain is definitely about the imagination mm -hmm. and what if, and not necessarily what is. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in exploring ideas and questions of what if. Um, and although I love reading biographies and I love reading nonfiction, mm -hmm. I've tried to write nonfiction and <laughs> no, my brain's just like, no, but what if it actually did this instead? <laughs> And so I have found that that's just not my gift. Have you ever, have you ever read the, um, uh, like that series that's, uh, Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter that okay. like almost feels super real, it, but it's, uh, it's super not real, you know, right. but it could be real. But it could be real. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really fascinating. And I do love books that are sort of what I consider alt history. So it's mm. taking a historical idea or mm. thing that happened in history, but then taking that what if and taking it in a completely different direction. Mm. So, um, I find that fascinating too, mm -hmm. but again, it's, it could be real. What happened, you know, if Hitler won the war, that like kind man of man in the thing. high castle, like man in the oh. high castle. Yeah. Exactly. So good. So it's fascinating. I mean, you can go so many different places mm -hmm. with fiction. Uh, and I feel like you can tell so many different truths using fiction mm -hmm. uh, that you can't necessarily when you're writing contemporary. So it's the what if that keeps the, uh, keeps the pen moving for you? Definitely. Definitely that what if and that building of worlds in my brain. Mm -hmm. it's just, I love it. It's exciting. So in terms of building worlds, what is, what is that writing process like and has it evolved over time? So I definitely think my process has evolved and I think it depends on the book. The story that's speaking to me 10 years ago is different than the story that's speaking to me now and how I'm, how I'm writing that story and working through that process it is completely different. And I can't even explain process really because it's so individual to each and every artist just mm -hmm. in general. So to say, okay, well, I sit down from eight to five and I, you know, write a hundred words or 10,000 words or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's not realistic to me. 
I'm right. sure there, are, I know there are other writers who do that. Um, so when I first started writing, I was very much kind of on that, okay, I need to write every day and I'm going to outline my story and I'm going to do all this character work and I'm going to have it detailed. And when I sit down to write, I'm going to know everything that happens. Well, my brain says, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> do you know what works is you just listen to your characters and they're going to take on a life of their own and they're going to tell you where the story is going to go and you're just along for the ride. Mm. Um, so that's kind of how my process has evolved over time. I have spent a lot of time fighting against that. Mm -hmm. A lot of time saying to myself that that's not how writers really work mm. because we're told, you know, you sit, if you don't write every day, you're not a writer. If you're not doing this, you're not a writer. If you're not doing that, you're not a writer, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Mm -hmm. You have to just follow your instinct. That's how I feel about art in general, whether that be writing, yes, that be painting, whether that be making music. Whatever it is, whether that be dancing, you have to follow your instinct because if you don't follow your instinct and you don't follow your heart, the art that you create isn't going to resonate in mm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. It's also the, the idea of forcing it. Yes. You know, where uh, it's not if, – if you're, if you're sitting there, if you're brainstorming and you get some really good ideas – and then you try to zero in on one and you can't go anywhere with it at that time, it, it's okay to put it aside and like go cook dinner or like go on a walk exactly. just because you're leaving, putting something down doesn't, even for a couple days, weeks, whatever, you know, have you ever done that? Have you ever had an idea for something, idea for a book? Maybe you've gotten a couple chapters in and then you can't anymore. So you leave it for an extended period of time? I have a lot of what I like to call fragments of stories. Sometimes it's even just a title. Sometimes it's a scene. Mm. Sometimes it's several chapters. Um, and when I say I leave something, I don't feel like I'm abandoning it. It's just that's not the time for me to be working on that particular thing. And I circle back to things. Sometimes I know if it's just a fragment that's just there to get something creative out and that's never going to turn into anything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there's always that feeling, you know, I, I mean, I feel like as an artist, I know when something is calling me mm. to work on it mm -hmm. and say, okay, this is, this is where you need to focus your attention. That doesn't mean you don't go off and you don't, you know, write a poem or, uh, draw a picture or go do something else creative. It's not taking away from your work. It's actually enriching it mm -hmm. is how I feel. Do you ever find yourself favoring uh, certain characters or favoring uh, a specific like plot line that you've just loved the whole time and known it was right the whole time? I think with character, I... For character, to me, is the starting point of everything that I do. So even some of my secondary characters, actually, in, the, in my very first book, there's a character called Marcus. And when I started writing, I had no idea this character existed. I was writing this scene with um, the male main character, and this guy popped up in the hallway, and started talking to my main character and I was like, this guy is funny. Like, who is he? And it was his best friend. And I had no idea that this guy even existed. Oh. And I know that makes me sound a little bit crazy, but that's mm. kind of how for me writing works. Like I, I didn't know him. He introduced himself and I was like, okay, then well, tell me more about you. Wow. Uh, so character to me is, is fascinating and they really do drive the story in ways that I don't expect. Yeah. I love that unexpectedness. I try to have an idea of where I'm going with the story, where it's going to end, but the characters really do help me drive that mm -hmm. by tapping into their personalities, their interests, 
and really getting to know them like you would a friend, basically. Yeah. Conversations. Yes, I have conversations <laughs> with imaginary people. That's what I do for a <laughs> That's so that's so interesting. I love I love the idea of not even having sat down and said, these are the characters, these are their backstories. You're just authentically letting your your characters and their instincts drive the story and then they're leading you to these other people that's so interesting that's such a cool thought process it's um it can be a little strange sometimes <laughs> but i tell you sometimes i think that i'm going to write something a certain way and then when i get in there and start to work on the scene it's almost as if they're like no that's not what really happened like let me tell you what happened this is what happened Okay, then let's go with that. <laughs> oh my gosh. And their ideas are usually better than mine, so it works out. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's so, that's so funny. Oh my gosh. Do you ever uh, feel sad when it's time to leave them behind when you've finished a novel or a series? Yeah, definitely. There's definitely a period of what I call like mourning mm -hmm. where you have this grief of, letting go you've completed it you're happy with it but you know that you're never going to tell that story again like that story has been told um and there is a little bit of grieving that you do after that moment i call it like the blue period where you just feel despondent and you don't want to work on anything else and you just kind of but you have to let yourself do that you have to say okay well i'm just going to grieve this yeah. And then I'll move on, you know, whether it's for a day or for a week mm -hmm. or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. definitely, I definitely feel sad when it's yeah. over. I wonder if, um, if you don't allow yourself that grieving blue period, if um, in the next project you start, if there's like remnants of those characters still there because you didn't properly leave them behind. That's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, I could see that kind of haunting mm -hmm. you a little bit into your next project. And I do think it's about just intuitively figuring out when you're ready to mm -hmm. move on and just trying not to force yourself because the more you force yourself, the less likely you're going to get words or characters that feel authentic. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. There's nothing wrong, though, with writers who want to you know, work to an outline, if that works for them and they're happy with the way that they're writing. My way is not the only way, it's not the right way. And I want other writers who are listening to the podcast to know that, that their journey and their process is their own. Mm. They have, just own it. Like, just take it and be like, this is how I work. And it doesn't matter what anybody else is saying or telling me because what works for me works for me. Mm -hmm. and that's all that matters. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm... I'm a stream of conscious, like stream of consciousness, like journaler. But as soon as I try to create anything, you should see the binders for this pod binders for this podcast. It's that kind of thing where my process doesn't necessarily fall in line in that. But in dance, my process is improv it out. Right. I can't sit down and choreograph something. I have to improv it and video it and then that's the piece and then I can learn it. <laughs> you know, it's so, it's so interesting in different disciplines, how that same process can still be applied and vary. I do. And I love that about the artist process because I could listen to people talk about their processes all day. Cause I think it's just fascinating because we're all so individual and tapping into that creative stream, which I think of it as sort of like a river and you just kind of have to, you know, dive into that river and see where it takes you. Um, and everybody is different mm -hmm. in the way that they access that. And I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Have you ever revisited a book for edits and alterations that was previously published? So that's a very good and sort of loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> so my first two novels, um, when they came out, um, it was super exciting. I worked so hard to get these books out. And I won't go into a lot of detail because it's a long story, 
but my publisher, um, there were some issues and I ended up having to get the rights back to my novels from mm. my publisher. So they were no longer able to publish my novels. So last year I decided, I mean, I have these books. What am I supposed to do now? They're not available. Mm -hmm. Um, so I decided to put the first one out myself. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did do a little bit of revising on the first book, changed a few scenes, um, did some edits that I felt like looking back on it made the story richer because mm -hmm. I had learned as a writer, I had grown in my art and I felt like I wanted to inject some of my new mm. processes and thought processes into the novel. Mm -hmm. That was a really odd thing to do, to revisit that story in such a way and to try and reshape it. Mm -hmm. using my skill set, which was better than it was 10 years ago, because that's what we should be doing is growing as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, and I re-released it with no preconceived ideas or notions. I just wanted to put it out for me to mm -hmm. have that done and have it out. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud of that. But it was a very strange, I don't think I'd ever do it again. Really? Yeah. Was it tough to not criticize your previous writing and just very. scrap the whole thing? So hard. So hard to read it and cringe a lot, you know? <laughs> How did you, why, what did you do this for? Like, honestly, Heather, what were you, what were you thinking? Um, you were definitely not listening to your characters in that moment because I don't think that's at all what she would do now. Um, so, it, it, yeah, I don't think I would ever do that again. So, um it's better to just have done something to put it out, be proud of it in the moment and say, that's who I was. That was my art at the time. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't diminish it just because I'm older, wiser, more experienced. I take that into my next book. I take mm -hmm. what I've learned from that and move to my next. So, mm -hmm. so I would never do that again. <laughs> Well, you are a woman of travel and adventure. Do you think your experience, uh, your experiences living all over the world influence your writing? Definitely think that that's the case. Um, I've always had a lot of wanderlust. It's been very hard for me to put down roots, I'll be honest. Um, I have put down roots now, which at 44 seems um, really late in life. <laughs> But, you know, um, I li I've lived in New York, I've lived uh, in England, I've lived in Scotland, and I lived in Kentucky for a while. Um, so it's great because you experience different cultures, different people, people with different ideas and different perceptions of life. And I think it's really important as a person and as an artist to kind of gather all of those things, because I do think it makes your art deeper mm -hmm. and more meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, Scotland in particular, uh, my husband happens to be Scottish. Mm -hmm. um, the novel that I'm working on now actually is, um, it's not based in Scotland, but it's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Inspired it's inspired by? by. Yeah. Yeah, it's inspired <laughs> by. That's the word. Three words, writer, we, we don't, don't mesh. Um, so it's inspired by the Picts and the Romans fighting at Hadrian's Wall. Though it's not mm. historical, it's just kind of using that as a springboard and then doing the what if, and I've created kind of my own world that resembles Rome and the Picts and what happened between them so interesting fantasy it's got magic it's got um you know wars and romance and all kinds of things oh so, that's that's fun yeah. like ancient war <laughs> yeah, we'll see it we'll see where it goes um, so that's what i'm working on now where's been your favorite place to live oh scotland definitely. scotland why yeah. scotland it's just magical. I can't, it's just <laughs> beautiful and magical and 
it's the front, just the air smells so fresh. And I lived on the coast near water and I love water. Oh, so yeah. being near the coast was amazing. Going to old castles and just exploring ruins and just the age and the history there is just so incredible. Mm. England was wonderful too, but Scotland to me just has a special place. So definitely. are you a, are you a Scotch drinker? I don't really drink much scotch. My uh, husband drinks scotch. No. Does he like Lagavulin? I have no idea what he drinks. He has uh, La- Lagavulin has this really beautiful uh, distillery, like on a cliff in Scotland. Ooh. Not on a cliff, but like close. And uh, oh, you know I want to go so bad. Honestly, no. And I should because it's my favorite drink. <laughs> and I was just on my bucket list to go but like oh we man. should go like we should go to scotland let's it do it <laughs> let's go to the distillery i'll drink yes. all the scotch yes i'm sure you they have, have beer and scotch. wine too <laughs> you can drink myself i don't dislike scotch it's just not something i'm like oh let's let's drink some scotch now See, i i must be a glutton for punishment because i like the like smoky peaty scotch the kind Mm -hmm. that you drink and your whole body gets warm right away that's my jam that's that's the good stuff so next time i go to scotland i will remember that i'm gonna get you some good scotch yeah it's the best you have to try it it's amazing lagavulin 16 years lagavulin you want to sponsor (laughs) you want to sponsor the podcast i'm advertising for you (laughs) exactly exactly well I'm definitely gonna have to check that out and now I'm curious where that is because I was on the west coast and I don't remember that distillery so it must be either up in the highlands or maybe east I think it's in the highlands right I'm pretty that sounds familiar that sounds familiar to me um, back on track. All right, as we just talk about spirits. <laughs> talking about spirits and stuff. I'm gonna make my drink after this. Um, <laughs> I know. Now I'm like, hmm, is it too early to drink? <laughs> yeah, no, on a Saturday. It's yeah. Saturday. It's brunch time. <laughs> <laughs> is there an author that you admire both in their writing and in their life? There are so many. This is such a difficult question. That's like asking me who my favorite child is. <laughs> um, you know, I love um, Robin Hobb, who I said I was revisiting her work. I love her work. It's just so imaginative, creative. Her characters are so real, even though she's writing fantasy. Mm-hmm. And she lives a very type of life that I like to live. She lives out in the country. She does, you know, has a vegetable garden, plays with their dogs. It's a kind of a quiet life. She doesn't, you know, tweet or get into battles on Twitter about, I don't know, stuff. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. I'm also a huge fan of Ursula Le Guin. Uh, I don't know her personally. I wish I did. That would be really (laughs) cool. But her work is so inspiring. And the fact that she's been writing you know, for decades as a woman in fantasy where, you know, is all about the man's quest Mm. and, you know, a lot of the fantasy authors in that are men or get a lot of recognition. And I feel like a lot of the female authors don't get as much recognition as Mm -hmm. the guys in Mm -hmm. that genre. Um, Also N.K. Jemisin, who's fantastic i love her work i found her last year and i'm just in love with her mm. her work um yeah i could go on but <laughs> <laughs> so many so many how do you how do you keep the editing process from feeling personal so this has taken me a really long time to really trust myself mm-hmm. as far as editing goes I think in the early years, I sought a lot of outside opinion, and that muddied my process and muddied the way that I do things. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's not because the feedback that I was being given wasn't valid. It's just learning when that feedback is good feedback and finding the right people to give you feedback. Because if you're just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall, you're getting all this feedback, some of it's conflicting, and you're just like, well, I don't 
I don't know. You know, I don't trust myself anymore. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to sit back, find your tribe, those people that you know are going to be honest with you, but also kind. Mm -hmm. And the type of feedback they're going to give you is constructive and useful. It's not just something like, well, I don't like your main character. Yeah. That's not able, yeah. Separating the feedback that is coming from personal taste versus right. actual useful feedback. Right. And finding that is hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really, really hard. Um, I've been really blessed. I have found um, my creative partner, her name is Sarah. And she's also a YA author. She's amazing. And we connected because she had her book published with the same publisher that I did. And we met um, at a big convention that we were both going to to sign books. And ever since that day, you know, we just get each other's work. We don't, our voices aren't the same necessarily. We're not necessarily writing the same types of things but our processes are similar mm. and we work really well together with just being able to brainstorm and say, ask the right questions of each mm. other about character and story. And that has made a huge difference mm. for me because I've learned to trust myself. I have her as a sounding board and she's honest with me and I have a two or three other people in that same vein. Right. But to have, you know, 20, 30 people that you are sending your work to out early is just to me, not a great idea because you're just getting noise and that noise just fuzzies everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, it, it puts more self doubt in there. Exactly. That, that process of, Oh my God, this is shit. (laughs) Right. This is shit. I don't know what to do with it. How do I fix it? Mm -hmm. the feedback I'm getting isn't helping me fix it. You know, it's just, Mm -hmm. I don't want to say meaningless because that makes it sound like it's not meaningful to have that feedback, but it's just the wrong feedback at the wrong time can really destroy your project Mm -hmm. and destroy your art. And you don't, you don't want that. Just trust your, try to trust yourself. Find those people in your life that are going to be honest but kind about it and who can give you helpful Mm -hmm. people. Now, that's completely different than putting your art out and then having, you know, readers or people commenting on that. That's a whole nother can of (laughs) (laughs) You just have to put it out and tell yourself, the readers who it resonates with are the readers it was meant. To yeah. Affect. I've, I've as of late been trying to live by the motto of not all art is for everyone. Exactly. And that even goes for my own personal taste. Cause for a long time, you know, we we're all guilty of saying this for like musicians and music and specifically, I feel like, well, we're all, people will be like, well, that's not real music. That's not real music. Right. That's not, it's, no, it's all music. You, it's just not for you. Exactly. So leave that alone and let those people enjoy that. You don't have to like it. Exactly. And, and if you don't, then that was clearly, you weren't the audience they had in mind when they created this. Exactly. And that's exactly how you have to live by as an artist. You have to separate that and say, your art's going to find the people that it needs to find and the people who don't like it it's not for them yeah. and but for myself i'm not a big fan of romance novels it's nothing wrong with them people love them people enjoy them there's a place for them and there's a place for those authors those authors work hard yeah you know they don't work the same way i do they don't write the same things i do and their work isn't for me yeah that's for somebody else and my work isn't for their readers it's going to be for somebody else yeah and that's okay you know there's yeah. room for everybody on the mm-hmm. show mm-hmm. it's not one way or the other is this is best and this is not yeah and I get annoyed with the whole judgmental thing oh about, yeah just you know <laughs> not bug yeah absolutely it's like when everyone was just like uh, half the people I this this just popped into my head just because they've announced that Twilight has a new installment where half the population loved it 
a right. little twilight and the other half just ridiculed every aspect of it. And like the, the movie adaptations were putting that aside. Cause right. That's completely different. <laughs> totally different. Mm. But it's, it's something where like, if you, if you're not into that genre, it's young adult, um, like vampire love stories. Right. If that a young adult, like vampire romance novel, that's what those are. And if that's not your shtick, then leave it alone. Right. <laughs> leave it alone. That's I, mean, not I got some pretty harsh criticism with my first book about the teenage drama in the book. And I was like, well, the book is for teenagers and about teenagers and about their drama in high school. So I don't think that that's a valid reason to give it a one star, but you oh. know whatever. <laughs> oh my God. People are so crazy. Oh my but that's the kind of thing you have to dismiss. You have to yeah. be like, okay, they gave it one star. It's fine. Somebody's going to read that review and they're going to say, oh, high school drama. Yeah, that's not in that. I'm not into that. I'm not going to buy that book. That's fine. Great. I don't want them to read the book. Yeah. <laughs> If they're not interested in the book, yeah, you can buy it and read it if it's really something you think you'd like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Has your family been supportive of your career? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we're in a very artistic family anyway, mm -hmm. um, and so from the time I was little, we've always been, you know, acting, singing dancing. My mother was an artist. She had her fingers in all kinds of creative outlets. Um, the only one who's not creative really is my dad. Um, so he just kind of, I think, looked around and said, oh, look at all my creative children. Oh, love them. Uh, and he's been very supportive. So I feel very, very blessed by that because I know there are a lot of artists out there that feel very misunderstood by their families and don't really have that support. Mm -hmm. The good thing is you can find that support and you can find that tribe outside of your family. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that support, you know, you'll, you can find it and it's okay. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt yourself doubting your career choice? Oh, all the time. <laughs> yeah. All there's the time. No, there's really no money in it. Let's just be, let's just be honest. <laughs> You know what though? I actually just thought of this. Have you ever have you ever dreamt of your any of your books becoming a movie? I think we all dream of that. <laughs> I think I would be lying if I said no. Um I actually even thought about, you know, my first book being a video game. I think it would actually I love video games. Like, it would be really cool to have that as a video game. Um but yeah, I think it would be amazing for that to happen. Um, and you never know. I mean, I will say things happen that you don't expect all the time. Um, you know, my publisher imploded, I got my rights back. And then I ended up getting an offer from the Czech Republic to publish the first book. My agent oh. made a deal that's sold. So I'll be having a book out of, in the Czech Republic, which is that's I mean, so cool. I have no idea if I, like, I wouldn't be able to read it because, <laughs> but it may be completely different than what I wrote. I don't know, but it'll have my name on it, I guess. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see what they do with the book. I love book covers. So yeah. I'm excited to see, like, what all that is going to look like when it finishes. I have no idea when that's coming out, but that deal just happened um, a few months ago. So. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um. Do you have any advice for budding writers? My advice is to write. Write what you love. Write what you feel. Continue to grow in your art. You know, don't write because you want to be published. Don't write because you think you're going to make a lot of money. Write because you love it. If you write because you love it, everything else will follow. Mm. But if you write specifically to be a New York Times bestseller or, you know, be published by the time I'm 16, which was one of my goals, by the way, it didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but those types of things, it's not, not to say don't have goals or don't have dreams or aspirations, but if that's the reason you're doing it, mm. 
and the only reason you're doing it for fame, mm -hmm. fortune, you know, name recognition, to be published, to get that agent. Mm -hmm. That's not what matters. What matters is, are you doing it because you love it? Because if you don't love it, this industry will tear you up. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that to scare people off, but it's a difficult, all artistic industries are difficult and it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. You have to really love it because it's a labor of love. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more no's than yeses. Yes. A lot more no's than yeses and a lot more, you know, I'm just going to have to eat ramen for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know? Or have another job, which I do, you know. Um, and most of the writers that I know don't make a living full-time at writing. And that's just the honest truth. Mm -hmm. We all have side gigs or, you know, work mm -hmm. full-time jobs elsewhere. And we write when we can. Mm. Um, some are fortunate that they get to write full-time and that's great too. And you can get there. Mm -hmm. It's just the path needs to be your path and you need to not look at anybody else's path and you need to do it for the love and the passion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before we get to our last two questions, do you have anything else that you would like to add about your books, your life, where we can find, um, your material or follow your, your journey? Yeah. So my website, heatherlreed.com, um, has information on my books. Uh, I also do coaching, creative coaching, uh, for writers, but I'm also open to other artists too, if they want to talk art. And there's more information about that on my website as well for the coaching. Um, you can find me on Instagram and you can find me on Facebook. I don't tweet. Uh, I did for a long time and it just upsets me. So <laughs> about two years ago, I never looked back. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that's where you can find me. Um, anything else I want to say? I think I'm good. All right. So I asked the last same two questions to everyone that comes through the podcast. The first is what is your second favorite color? My second favorite color would probably be, ooh, some thunder, sorry. Is that thunder? Oh my <laughs> gosh. Oh, that's scary. Yeah, we're having some pretty wicked storms. Um, oh gosh. Probably turquoise. Turquoise? Why turquoise? I just love sort of that green blue. It makes me think of the ocean. Yeah, love it. It's just so soothing to me. Like my bedroom is sort of a turquoisey color, and yeah, it's just... It's just calming. Reminds me. Of, yes, love it. <laughs> I'm showing her. You guys can't see what's happening. I have a bunch of turquoise stuff, and I just keep pointing them out and holding <laughs> like, them like, up. I think this turquoise. is a turquoise blanket. All this yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 All right. And so, lastly, what, in your opinion, is the best part of being a woman? Honestly, I think being a woman is amazing. It's the other women that I get to meet and support and the support that I get from other women, I know we, you know, we see in movies and things, women always fighting and, you know, backbiting and that type of thing. And that's not my experience. My experience has been that women who support each other, there is nothing that can stop us. Mm. You know, there's a strength and resilience and a beauty about women getting together and talking and exploring and doing things and changing the world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what I think is amazing about being a woman. I agree 110,000%. And I can say specifically on that last comment is uh, this, this podcast is, I think, it, in ter with all these interviews has been an example of that in that I was telling you earlier, I didn't anticipate the um, enthusiasm of the women I approached to to be interviewed. Um, and it's been awesome. And the support that everyone has for one another and then people saying, uh, oh, this, you know, it was, it was so cool to hear this person have this experience because I had it too. And oh, it's so, it's such, that's, Truer statements have never been said. <laughs> You're giving me chills, actually. It just makes me happy to hear that. 
Oh man. Well, thank you again for taking the time to sit down and chat today. You've got me ready to open a new book and just dive into some, some literature that's sitting in my bookshelf over there that I've been staring at. <laughs> well, now I need to know what you might read next. Cause I love talking books. My favorite, one of my favorite books is the beautiful and the damned. Um, mm. that's one of my absolute favorites. I'm not sure why it's a, I think it's just a form of escapism. I think it's Fitzgerald's best work personally. Uh, I love Gatsby, but like, I think this is better written, um, and more depth in the characters. So I think I'm going to reread that for a little bit of a escapism right now. <laughs> you don't have to read that because I never have. I read Gatsby, but so now, Ooh. now I'm getting, it's now not, getting it's not very long and it's so good. It's so sad. I cried you know, one of those kind of things. <laughs> oh, I, love, I love my heart being broken. I'm all for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also anything by Edith Wharton. She's my favorite author. She, oh my gosh, way ahead of her time, but just incredible. Um, wow. I could talk books all day. Too. <laughs> oh, oh man. You're in the right place for that. Right? I'm like halfway through my like outro and I'm like, Oh, but more books. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you listeners for tuning in again. Uh, as always, don't forget to rate, review, and tell your friends. It really helps the podcast grow so that more people can be inspired by these incredible women that we get to talk to and about every week. You can also follow us on Instagram at Women of Her Story Podcast, and you can send us an email to Women of Her Story Podcast at gmail.com. Until next week, be safe, stay healthy, and show the world what you're made of. This is a New York Glitch production.